Well, Cedar Street Baptist Church, I sure do love you. It's my joy to be with you here this morning. Perhaps you picked up on a theme uh, during our song service. Uh, and it's one of my, if not my absolute favorite theme to think about, uh, to celebrate, and to share with you behind this pulpit. And that's our friendship with Christ. We are uh, in the midst of a sermon series in my, one of my favorite sections of the Bible. The sermon series is Return to the Upper Room as we've been looking word by word, verse by verse, uh, through John chapter 13 to John chapter 17, looking at this upper room scene, this one meal that Jesus has with His disciples. Again, five chapters and 155 verses on one single meal as we hear the very heart of Jesus through His last words at this Last Supper. And we are getting through John 15 now as we turn to verses 13 through 15. The title of our message here this morning, surprise, surprise, is what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Uh, you know, I just I want to confess my heart to you. I, um, I've been a Christian now for 15 years. As I look around this room, many of you, if not most of you in this room, have been following him longer than I have. I can tell you that since I have been saved, which was at age 27, uh, I have, and I don't think this is an exaggeration to say that at least a portion of every single day in the last 15 years, I have sought to understand God better. I have sought him in his word. I've sought him through Christian books. I've sought him through Christian mentors and friends. I haven't always gotten it right. In fact, I've probably gotten it wrong a lot more than I've gotten it right, but God's been faithful. But can I just confess something to you today? And I will not get through this message without crying. I know I won't. You are warned. <laughs> of all the things that I've studied and of all the things that I've learned and all the glorious truths of the Christian faith and the fact that God became a man and, and He lived for us and He died for us and He rose for us and He ascended to the Father and He sent down His Holy Spirit and we've been given eternal life and we're going to be in heaven and we're, we're going to do all of these things. <laughs> you know what I can't get over? Jesus Christ calls me his friend. The creator, the redeemer, the sustainer looks me in my eyes and he looks you in your eyes and he calls you his friend. When, when you tear everything down to the studs and you think about heaven and you think about eternity and you think about walking with Jesus, it all comes down to this. We are invited into an eternal friendship and there is just no greater gift that He can give us than this. And so, yes, I'm a little passionate about this topic. And... Um, and I've been frustrated about this topic, and we'll get into this, because I believe the liberal world has cheapened this friendship. But we're going to redeem that back today. So as we walk into John 15, verses 13 through 15, what's our big idea in one sentence? When we realize what a friend we have in Jesus, we can finally begin to abide in His love. When we realize what a friend we have in Jesus, we can finally begin to abide in His love. So if you want to know more about this friend we have in Jesus, would you join me by turning to the book of John? We're going to be in <laughs> chapter 15. Uh, we're going to be in verses 13 through 15. If you don't have a Bible, grab the Pew Bible in front of you or beside you on page 1072. And if you would stand at this time, out of the reverence of the reading of God's holy, infallible, inerrant, and fully sufficient word, we are in John chapter 15, starting in verse 13 and working our way through verse 15. Hear God's word to us through His servant, the Apostle John, inspired of the Holy Spirit, giving us the very words of Jesus himself. Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my 
friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what the master is doing. Oh, Jesus, help me today. But I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my Father. I make it known to you. Let's pray. Lord, you are so good. Oh, you are so good, Jesus. You offer us your friendship and we skip over it. We, we, we just ignore it. We cheapen it. We take it for, for granted. We use it as a license to sin instead of a, an offer of experiencing your love. Lord, I just pray this morning that your humble, gentle spirit would just overtake this sanctuary and every anxiety that we experience right now. Oh, Lord, your friendship is so sweet. It's what all of us need. Help us to abide in that today. Help us to hear every word that you have for us, Lord. Oh, Jesus, you were with me in the preparation of this message. I need you to be with me in the preaching of it. Let us know your sweet friendship, I pray. In Christ's name, and God's people said, Amen. Amen. One of the reasons that I feel like God's called me when I preach to preach word by word and verse by verse, it's because none of these verses come to us in isolation. They are all fit in a context, and a lot of times we miss the meaning when we pull it out of the context. And so I want to backpedal for just a second. I know a lot of people have been coming in and out the past few weeks. Uh, we can't understand this passage if we don't understand everything he's been saying so far in John 15. So two words that we defined the last few weeks, and I just want to mention them again because the world has defiled these words, and we're going to redeem them back for the glory of God today. Those words are love and abide. Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, and Jesus has been saying this in the upper room over and over and over, abide in my love. If you love me, you'll obey me. When you love others, you'll know, they'll know that you're my disciples. What does he mean when he says love? Again, the world would say that love is purely an emotion. We fall in love, we fall out of love. But that's not what the Bible teaches We've said this many times, that love according to the Bible is a sacrificial commitment to unconditionally pursue someone's greatest good for God's greatest glory. And yes, I do want to say, and I want you to feel this today, out of the love that Christ has for you, yes, His affection for you is white hot. But it's not less than his affection. Love is even more. Love is the commitment that comes with that affection. And that love and affection that he has for us, he calls us to have that for other people. But we can't do that in our own strength. We don't have the capacity to love others the way that God does, yet he commands us to do that. So you say, well, Jesus, I can't love like you do, yet you command me to do it. How can I accomplish this? And Jesus says, in your own strength, you can't. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. You say, well, what does that mean, Jesus? Jesus is saying, and this was the, the point of our message last week, he's saying, come to me and abide in my love. All right, we said abide is to surrender to, depend on, trust in, lean into, and remain with the source outside of yourself. So last week, the title of our message was leaning into his love. We, we need to go back to the source. You cannot love others until you come to the realization of how loved you are by Christ. It is when your heart is filled to overflowing with an undeserved love that God has for you that you can begin to pour out that undeserved love on other people. And the only way we do that is to go back to the vine every day and abide in the love of Christ. And that leads us to where we are here in, in uh, the verses 13 through 15. How do we practice this abiding love? Well, in one word, friendship. 
Jesus has invited you into the greatest friendship that you could ever experience. Now, years ago, I would not even want to use that word behind this pulpit because, again, the liberal world has cheapened that. All right, I've seen people wander the world with t-shirts that say, Jesus is my homeboy. You know, and it just makes Jesus our bud. And Jesus is okay with whatever I'm going to do because He's love. He accepts me just as I am and I can do whatever I want and have license to do whatever I want. And Jesus is going to affirm that because He is my bud. And that's not the type of friendship Jesus is calling us into. But because I've, I've gotten so frustrated over the years at liberal Christians who have cheapened that word, I've just abandoned it altogether. Uh, until uh, the recent season in my life where the Lord has drawn me back in and said, you know what? Certain aspects of that may be cheapened by the liberal world, but don't miss what I have for you. Don't miss the spirit I have towards you. I want us to go back and redeem this word friendship, and I want us to understand what it means because I believe it's the greatest gift that God is offering us today, His friendship with Christ. So, and I also want to say that as we talk about this friendship with Christ, I want you to think for just a moment about why it is that God created us. Stop and think about this for just a moment. So again, when you study the Bible and you see the glory of God and you see that we are called to praise and worship God as we witness His glory and we're called to build His kingdom and all these things are eternally true and I don't want to stack one above the other. They're, they're all part of God's grand plan. But if God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, and if God enjoyed wonderful love and fellowship within Himself, within the Trinity, that means that God was not lonely when He created the world. And God does not need us to worship Him. Now, He is worthy of our worship. In fact, the word worthy comes, or the word worship comes from worthy. When we worship Him, we're actually giving Him our worth-ship. But we shortened it to the word worship. But He does not need that. He's worthy of it, but He doesn't need it. He's completely satisfied in Himself. So the question is, if He doesn't need anything, then why did He create us? Well, Bo, maybe he needed messengers or servants. No, he's got billions of those. Guess what they're called? Angels. And they do their job very well. And if they don't do their job and they turn away from God, those fallen angels are called demons and they will have an eternity separated from God. So the question is, he's completely fulfilled without us. He doesn't need messengers. He's got billions of them. Why did God create us? And I think one of the answers is just to make it as simple as possible. God desired friendship. Again, God desired friendship. He desired to create a creature in His image called human beings. And He desired to have eternal fellowship with you and me. And again, this is, this is a friendship that goes a lot deeper than any friendship we've experienced here on earth. But don't miss the sweetness of it. Don't miss the intimacy of it that God wants to have with all of us. That's what we're going to look at here today. So I want you to see friendship with Christ as a motive behind the creation of the earth. Why is it that we don't experience that? Well, the answer is sin. But the resolution to that sin is Christ. So I want to look at three aspects of this, this friendship we have with Christ. What separates Jesus from every other friend we have? Well, we're going to look at three aspects of that. Here's the first. Number one, Jesus is our most humble friend. I, I, I want you to look at this like you've never looked at it before, okay? I want you to hear me clearly. Jesus is the most humble friend we have. In verse 13, he says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Now, in a second, I'm going to talk about how that humility led to his crucifixion and his resurrection. But let me start first with the very heart of Christ. Do you know in the New Testament there's only one verse where Jesus talks about his own heart and his own spirit? And I have this particular verse hanging in my office because I often forget how Jesus sees me. And if you have forgotten the love that Christ has for you, perhaps you need to remember this verse as well. It's Matthew chapter 11. And in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. That's the heart that Jesus has had since eternity past, 
And that's the heart that Jesus has for me and you as sinners today. He is gentle. He is lowly. He is kind. He is patient. You say, well, he's that way once you repent. Well, the Bible also says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He's not gentle towards you because you repent. You ought to repent because you know how gentle he is towards you. That's the difference. He is gentle and lonely. He is for you. And because of that, gentle, that gentleness and lowliness, that meekness, that, that, that just ability to uniquely love each of us, he was willing to die that we would live and be with him forever. And that's a whole other level of humility. In, in Philippians chapter 2, perhaps you've heard this amazing passage, but just listen again. If you've heard it a thousand times, you're going to hear it a thousand and one. In Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5 through verse 8, Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by become, oh, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There is no humility like this in all of creation apart from Christ. All right, first of all, again, He is God the Son from eternity past, and He created us to have fellowship with Him. Our sins separated us from Him. And so He willingly, knowing what would happen when He did, coming for that very reason, took on the form of human beings. I want you to think about this. The God of the universe humbled Himself in such a way that he became a single human cell in the womb of Mary. And from that single human cell, as again, he was formed in the womb of Mary, throughout his entire 33 years here on this earth, he constantly took the posture of humility. How was he born? In a manger in Bethlehem. How did he live? A carpenter in a podunk town called Nazareth. When Philip told Nathaniel to come follow him, Nathaniel said, does anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was one of those towns just off the map. And consistently, Jesus takes that posture of humility because that's his spirit. He has a spirit of humility. He's the easiest person to be with. He understands us in a way that nobody else does. And let me say, in the humility that he came, in the humility that he lived, in the humility that he died, in the humility that he rose and ascended and sent down the Holy Spirit, it's the same humility that he walks with you today. He knows every single anxiety you brought into this sanctuary right now. And he says, come, find rest with me, fellowship with me. Know how my heart burns for you. How my desire is to take your cares and anxieties. That you would take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm gentle and lowly and you'll find rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the Jesus that saved us and the Jesus that walks with us. He is for us and if he is for us, who can be against us? Yes, Jesus is our most humble friend. But you say, Bo, I don't know if I experience that all the time. Well, the answer to that is point two. Jesus is not only our most humble friend, Jesus is our most holy friend. All right? And here is where if there was, a, again, a liberal believer or a non-believer that loves talking about the love of Jesus, here's where they would walk out or tune out if they're looking on the Internet right now. Because Jesus, in His love and in His humility does not lower his holy standards at all. And here's what he says in verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And you say, well, Jesus, I thought you loved me no matter what. Yeah, he does. Jesus' love for you is not dependent upon your obedience. Hear me clearly. I said that a couple weeks ago. I'm going to keep repeating that so you understand. Jesus is not saying, I will love you when you obey. Jesus is saying, I will know that you love me when you obey. And the reason that we obey is because we're already recipients of his love as unworthy as we are. His love is holy. His love is holy. 
Just because he's humble does not mean he lowers his standards. Now again, he knows every hair on your head. He knows every thought in your mind. He knows every attitude in your heart. He knows every action of your life. And yet, he loves you. And he loves me. And so he does not want us to run away from him in our sin. He wants us to draw closer to him in our sin. Because as we experience that love, and we see the humble spirit that he has, we ought to hear with the kind, gentle spirit of Christ. That's that word, repent. Repent. Jesus says, I have so much more for you than the life that you've chosen or the decisions that you're making. You know the decisions that you're making are not right. Repent. If you love me, obey me because my commandments are what is best for you. My commandments are going to prepare for you the life that you've always wanted in friendship with me, so repent. You know, I'll, I'll put it this way. When we learn to call Jesus Lord, that's when we can also hear Him call us friend. We need to understand who He is and repent. But you know, I think I've gotten this wrong over the years and some t sometimes. Now, there is a place for righteous indignation. There is a time and a place where Jesus himself overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple. And upon the return of Christ, if you turn to the end of the story in Revelation, yes, Jesus will come back with righteous indignation and he will judge the earth and he will refine this place by fire. So don't mistake his humility for weakness. And don't mistake his humility for excusing sin. But right now, you and I live in an age of grace. And that grace is available while we still have breath in our lungs. Now, we don't know if we're going to lose that breath by the end of this service. But while we still have breath in our lungs, what I want you to hear, what I want you to get is this. The Jesus that calls you to repent is not saying it like this. He's saying it like this. Repent. Enjoy this friendship with me that I have desired for you to experience since I created you. You know, I was thinking of this the other day. I'll never forget this moment. Uh, about two, maybe two or three years ago, there was a family from Florida that had a certain individual living here in Metter who passed away tragically. He was a young man, I think in his late 40s, early 50s, uh, who died of a drug overdose. And the family was working with one of the funerals here in Metter. And the funeral director called me and said, they don't have a pastor, but of all the pastors in Candler County, for some reason, I just feel like you would work best with them. <laughs> now, I, I got there and I met the, the lady that was organizing the service and she was a very charismatic Yankee from up north. And I figured out real quickly why he called me. <laughs> I said, I called him back later. I said, I'm, a, I'm the only Yankee preacher you have in your Rolodex. Uh, so I began to speak with this lady, and of course she was a little abrasive, a little bit rough on the edges, probably not a Christian. Uh, I did explain to her if she wanted me to do the service, I said, I'm going to honor Jesus. I said, I'm not going to shove my, my faith down your throat, but I believe that in any opportunity to speak is an opportunity to share Christ, because that's where hope is. And she said, okay. So I went home. And I began to think through what I was going to preach. And here's what my thought was. Okay, I'm going to have more people in one room who don't know Jesus than at any other time this year. So I've got to be clear in sharing the gospel. I've got to be clear in sharing the plan of salvation. I, this is a chance I may not get again. But as I began to do that, I'm telling you, I was brushing my teeth. And I was overwhelmed by the Spirit of God. And I felt Jesus, not in an audible voice, but just a thought that he impressed in my spirit. And the thought was, I want them to know my heart. And I'm going to tell you, I got up behind that pulpit and I saw a room full of people. In that room were probably a lot of drug addicts, a lot of people who were probably hung over from the night before. Again, they were very loud and abrasive. Uh, these are not people who know, knew Christ or were following Christ. And as I opened the Bible and read from Matthew 11... I talked about what a friend you have in Jesus and it was like there was just this collective exhale in the room. It was like Jesus was present with every single one of them. Now years ago I would not have done that out of fear that they would think his friendship is cheap. 
But I finished that message sharing the plan of salvation and whether or not they think that his friendship is a license to do whatever they want and he's okay with it, they got to deal with Jesus on that. But what I wanted them to know and what I want you to know today is his heart, his gentleness, his lowliness, his kindness, his desire to have fellowship with you. Yes, you can respond to that by doing whatever you want to do and think he's okay with it and you'll find out at the end of your life that he's not. But don't abuse the grace while it is there today. Hear his heart. Hear him wooing you to come and follow him, to sit with him and enjoy his presence, to obey his commands and hear him call you friend. That's Jesus, our most holy friend. Third and finally, Jesus is our most humble friend. Jesus is our most holy friend. Third, Jesus is our most honest friend. I want you to listen to verse 15. It says, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You know what friends do? Friends offer us intimacy and transparency. Friends offer you the opportunity to share your heart, and they're willing to reciprocate that and share their heart. That's where friendship is built, right? We share our heart, we receive their heart in return, and that love and that connection, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Well, how much more the God of the universe who desires that friendship with us. You know, here's the thing about God. God did not have to reveal himself to us. And if he decided that he would not give us his word, could we know that a God exists? Yes. That's why the Bible says that nobody who has who's ever gone their entire life without hearing the Bible is without excuse at judgment because the Bible says that even creation is proclaiming the glory of God. You look outside and you see the sunrise and the sunset, you cannot ignore the fact there is a God. He's written it on your heart. But we could not know anything specifically about God if He had not condescended to us to give us His Word, if He had not got down on our level to reveal Himself. And that's what God has done in the, in the Bible. Let me just say this. God gave us this because he is a God who wants to be known. Because he is a God of relationship. He did not give this to us as a theological revolver to pistol whip us every time we sin. Now, he did give us this to remind us of his standards so that we don't live in sin. But you need to see the Bible as a desire for the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to reveal themselves to you because they desire fellowship with us and that's the most honest friendship we have. And Jesus says to his disciples in the upper room and he says to us today these words. I don't just call you servant, I call you friend because if you were just my servant, I would only tell you what you need to know but you're my friend because I've told you everything. I've told you who I am, the Son of God. I've told you what I'm gonna do, go to Jerusalem and be crucified for your sins. I've told you how I'm go- what I'm going to do three days later. I'm going to rise from the dead. I've already told you that I'm going to ascend to the Father, and it'd be good for you that I do that to send down my Holy Spirit. And he says, as I do that, don't worry because I'm coming back because I've prepared a place for you in my Father's house. And that's Jesus, our best friend. He did not have to tell us those things, but he did because why? He desires friendship with us. He desires this wonderful friendship with us. He wants us to know his nature. He wants us to know his character. And yes, he wants us to know his will. I get so frustrated because there's a common statement I've heard over the years. I've heard it from so many different people. And here's here's the statement. God's got a plan and that's all I need to know. False. God's got a plan and you better know what it is because he went to great lengths to tell you what it is. And he wants you to be faithful to the plan because he wants eternal friendship with you. He wants us to obey him and he wants us to walk with him. And he's, again, he's relentlessly at work in our lives. Please hear my heart on this. You say, well, if, if Jesus is my friend, why doesn't he protect me from pain? Jesus takes you by the hand and he walks with you through pain. And the reason why is he knows that that pain will prepare you for eternity in a way that nothing else will. 
Do you know that Jesus is not just interested in bringing you into heaven? No, Jesus is interested in making you more like him every day. Because we're not only preparing for life, we're preparing for eternal life. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, if we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will deny us. We are going to be on the throne reigning with Christ. What's that going to look like? I'm not 100% sure because I'm not there yet and neither are you. What I do know is this. Jesus is focused on your eternity and he will relentlessly pre prepare you for that eternity. So what does that mean? He's gonna take us through some dark valleys. But you know what? He's not gonna leave us there by ourselves. As we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil for he is with us. His rod and his staff comforts us. All right? It's not the promise that we will have peace. It is that we will have a shepherd to walk with us whether we have peace or not. That's the friend we call Jesus. It's the friend we call Jesus. He's the most humble, holy, honest friend we have. How do I sum this up? Again, in one sentence to kind of wrap this whole thing up. If we will surrender to Jesus as our Lord, He will abide with us forever as our friend. If we surrender to Jesus as our Lord, He will abide with us forever as our friend. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. He's in the upper room. He's talking to His disciples. They've been walking with Him for three years. For three years they've called Him Master. For three years, they've called him Lord. For three years, they've called him teacher. And Jesus says, now you can call me a new word. You can call me friend. And what does Jesus do for his friends? What did he do for the disciples? Well, he chose them. He was faithful to them. He walked with them. He served them. He taught them. He corrected them. He provided for them. He fed them. He prayed for them. He healed them. He forgave them. He died for them. He rose for them. He's coming back for them. And he loved them and he loves us to the very end. That's what Jesus does for his friends. That's what Jesus does for his friends. You know, I'll, I'll close with this. I may have mentioned this last week. You know, oh, Prayer for me has been, an, it has been a 15-year experiment, if you will. Well, really a lifelong experiment. Uh, you know, as a young child, even if I didn't know God, I certainly prayed seeking to know God. But can I just share with you, I have, a, I have the capacity to really complicate things sometimes. I don't know if you know that. I, I want to get things right. I think God honors that, right? I mean, there's a desire to make things right. And so when I study the Bible, I want to make sure that I'm not leading you astray as your shepherd. And sometimes the Bible, again, leads us into deep waters. And a lot of the truths of God have to be spiritually discerned. And they can be very confusing. But can I tell you the deepest and most transformative and meaningful moments of my life really in the past several months? It has been the moments in my life when I get, and I, this happened a lot recently, when I can't sleep, I get up and I just sit on the edge of my bed. And I learned this from Bill Collins. I scoot over and I pat the other side of my bed and ask him to sit with me. And I put my hand out and I talk to him like a friend. You know, for most of my Christian life, I'm scared of doing that because I don't want to cheapen Jesus because the liberal world does that. And Jesus says, don't let them mess up what we have. Bo, if you're willing to obey me and seek me, you can talk to me like a friend. Can I challenge all of you to do the same thing? Can I challenge you, whether you're having the best day of your life, the worst, the worst day of your life, or somewhere in between, can I challenge you to get alone with God and talk to Him the way that you would talk to your very best friend? Now, I don't mean that in, in, in an irreverent way. Again, Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. So understand, Jesus is not lowering his holy standards. He, he expects us to serve him and to love him, to obey him. 
But he's not waiting for our obedience to be perfect for us to call him friends or for him to call us friends. So as we draw to a close in a, in a message that we've talked about in the friendship that we have with Christ, can I just tell you right now, he knows what you're going through. He knows the pain that you're experiencing. He knows the separation that you're going through with loved ones who've passed. He knows the struggle you're having with people in your life, the strained relationships that you have. He knows the, the struggles and the anxieties and the worries. He knows all of it. Don't miss out on what He's offering you today. A chance to come and sit and be with the greatest friend you've ever had, the holiest friend you've ever had, the humblest friend you've ever had, the most honest friend you've ever had. Spend a little bit more time with Christ. Yes, repent. Yes, obey. But understand, He's gentle and lowly. And He's the place you'll find rest. Cedar Street, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend. <sighs> Jesus, I just feel so inadequate to express your friendship. It's not cheap. You laid down your life for the opportunity for us to be reconciled to you as a friend. And you gave us your commands to be obeyed. And we fall short every day. You call us friends. You come to us with open arms. Your heart is so tender. Your spirit is so gentle. Your patience is so long-suffering. You know the weakness of our frame. You know that we are but dust. You keep all our tears in a bottle. You walk with us every moment, day and night. You are the shepherd in the dark valley. And you call us your friends. Oh, Jesus, would we taste your friendship today in a way that we've never tasted it before. Yes, Lord, would it lead us to repentance? Would it lead us to trust? Would it lead us to ob abide, abide in the vine, that you would bear fruit, that we would love you in a way that we've never loved you before, and that when we experience your love, it would lead us to repentance, faith, and loving others the way that you've loved us. Oh, Lord, that's when they will know that we are your disciples. What a friend we have in you. May we know that friendship today. In Jesus' name, amen.